Hello, Megan. How are you? Good. Hi, Erin. So great to connect with you. It's been been a while since we've seen each other, since we had our group weekly meetings, which were incredibly amazing. We were just talking off air how helpful they were for both of us as entrepreneurs. Yes. Well, I'm really excited to talk with you today. I know we both share a lot of passions professionally um, and with health and gut health. So I think we have a lot of great things we can talk about today. Yeah. And this, the thyroid gut connection is one in which I, I really do believe deserves a lot of attention, you know, especially when we see these rising rates of thyroid issues coming out in the research. And when you reached out, I was like, absolutely. This is such a great topic to talk about. Um, so in terms of why you're interested in this field, and you actually have a course coming out uh, in January, the it's called the thyroid balance course, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it that kind of uh, inspired you to do this? Well, um, I guess it was 2016. I was diagnosed with Graves disease, which is a the autoimmune version of hyperthyroidism. And how that even came about is we were trying to start a family. And um, we knew that, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen right away. But after a year of not getting pregnant, we thought, okay, let's go talk to a fertility doctor. Maybe we need to do IVF. What are our options? And so we did a really comprehensive blood work and all these other tests to find out that my thyroid um, was, was really off. And um, which was interesting because I had done blood work, you know, six months or so. And it wasn't like I hadn't done blood work in that time period. I always wonder too, I, we'll talk about this, but stress I realize is a major trigger for me and the stress of infertility. I wonder if that really kicked things into that gear among other things, because health is a real puzzle. But at that point, the fertility doctor said, you know, we can't proceed with any fertility related things until your thyroid is fixed. So I'm going to refer you to an endocrinologist. The endocrinologist did a bunch of other tests um, to then diagnose me with Graves disease. And at that point, she had mentioned that my only options were medication, radiation, or surgery to kind of remedy my thyroid imbalance. And I just felt like those all seemed really extreme for me. And being a dietitian, I just, and, and wanting, I've always been passionate about looking at health holistically. I just had questions for her. I was like, well, is there anything I can do nutritionally? Like, is there any, anything else that I can do? And she just was like, no, this is the protocol. Like, those are your three options. So I said, okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave your office now. And I just was like, I'm going to go to the library. I'm just gonna take a pause because I actually didn't have really extreme symptoms. We can talk about symptoms more of what I had and what are symptoms to look for. But I felt like I don't really feel that awful. I feel like I have a little bit of time before I just make a decision. So I went to the library. I got like every book I can find on thyroid health, autoimmune conditions. And I just wanted to take a few weeks just to learn like what I wanted to learn about my body and learn about this condition and not just sign up for something blindly without really getting to know my body. And in doing that, it just opened up the, this, this world of like, gut health and, and so much information. And I was like, there is, there's a lot here. And so I um, hired a naturopath because I wanted to do a bunch of other testing and brought all this information to the naturopath. So I'm, I'm one of those people who it's like, I read this and I read this. And like, luckily she was like, yes, that's what I would recommend and was on board with a lot of things. Um, but it was really nice having her professional, you know, even being a health professional, sometimes we need to hire another health professional, whether they have the qualifications to run tests or also just to have that outside perspective, because when it's you and you're emotional and it's your body, it's really nice to have another health expert to be able to help you and guide you. So I worked with her and we ran a bunch of different tests, food allergy tests, heavy metal testing. Um, what else did we test for? Uh, Candida, a bunch of other tests. And then I essentially went on this very focused six month protocol for, you know, working on my gut health, taking different herbs and supplements, really making huge changes in my lifestyle. Um, and we were continuously checking my blood work and then eventually got to the point where my labs were all great again. And, um, and then I got pregnant with my daughter and it was just like this beautiful, like blessing. And I was so grateful that, that I hadn't just said, okay, you know, to the endocrinologist and I really looked into my health more. So that was kind of, of the beginning of the journey. And then I had my daughter, um, my thyroid um, stayed great throughout all my pregnancy. Um, and then I 
got pregnant again with my son when my daughter was like one years old. So I had my kids very close together, back to back, like overlapping because I was still nursing my daughter when I got pregnant with my son. So there was like four years where my body didn't really have a break. And after my son was born, when he was three months old, there was the pandemic, we moved and postpartum in general can be very stressful. And I feel like it was just like compounding. And I, my body was like very unhappy. I had really bad rosacea. Like it looked like I had a horrible sunburn. I was like, why do I still look like I'm six months pregnant? Like my, I had a lot of digestive issues. And so I was like, I need to, I need some blood work. We need to figure this out. So um, my thyroid swung to hypothyroidism. I found out I had um, pretty bad SIBO and um, because also I was like, I bet I have SIBO. Like my stomach is so distended. And for people who have rosacea, it's really, really common like to have SIBO. So um, I worked again with a naturopath to do a whole protocol to clear the SIBO, which that was like not fun, but also just like, I was like, okay, I've been here before. I believe that my body can heal. Let's do this. Cleared the SIBO. So grateful for that. My rosacea cleared up so much better, which if you've ever had skin conditions that are so terrible. Like it was very depressing for me because like I could still cry about it because it's so hard to look in the mirror and just be like, I, I, I don't like the way that I look. And it's like, you can kind of put makeup on, but you know, this is about thyroid health and not rosacea, but I had, there's two different types of rosacea where it's just red, but then you can also get like the Demodex mites where it gets all bumpy and you can't really hide bumps with makeup. So I just had horrible skin for a period of time. And it just was, it just tanked my self-esteem, which is not good for your stress and your mental. It was a very, um, like my body was just like, everything is really not good. So I really had to then be like, okay, like my body needs a lot of support. So it was interesting. Like I knew the, the fundamentals of thyroid support, because whether you have hyper or hypo, there's a lot of similarities, but then it was also interesting to be on the hypo side and be like, well, what do I need to do differently now that I'm hypo? And so again, like worked with herbs and nutrition, and again, a lot of lifestyle, figuring out what are my personal triggers and helped my body get back into a healthy spot. And it's like, it's hard work, but I'm really grateful that like twice now I've had a thyroid imbalance and twice now I've been able to bring it back within balance and maintain, um, my thyroid has been great. Um, and so it's, it's really common. It's more common in women than men to have a thyroid condition. It's really frustrating. It can be a puzzle piece. It's not always just like, it's just do this one thing and it's fixed. So I have a real heart for helping people with it because personally, I've been there on both sides. Um, and professionally as a dietitian, I've always been passionate about helping people just live a healthy life, get to the root causes of their health imbalances. So that's really what led into, I was like, I should make this course. And people always ask me what I cook for my thyroid health. So I made a cookbook for that. And then um, we can talk about this more, but um, really like stress management has been so helpful for me. And meditations has been just a really powerful way that I've learned how to like calm my body and like take a pause and learn how to breathe. And so I created um, a meditation pack as well, just to help guide people through breath work and guide people through like a body scan of how to like, how to relax <laughs> because we just go, go, go. And sometimes we don't realize all the tension we're carrying all the time. And it's really, even if you just do it for like two minutes or five minutes in the day, it's actually really helpful that consistency of giving your nervous system a break throughout the day. So I've created some resources that I hope are very helpful for people, but that's a little overview of where I've been and, and what I'm offering and why I'm so passionate about thyroid health. Wow. That's incredible. And, and I love that you brought up the part about fertility because um, this is something that I tell my clients all the time is just get your thyroid tested, like even before you get pregnant, just so you, that you don't have to go through that journey where you then go to find out that this was something that's been in balance for so long. So I think it's good for the listeners to, to hear your story and, and maybe be inspired to make sure that they're getting those regular labs done for thyroid function. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And speaking of regular labs too, is, is most doctors will only test for TSH, um, which TSH is not really a true indicator of thyroid health because it's a pituitary hormone. And so really it's important to not just test TSH, but test your free T4 and your free T3 
also your reverse T3. And if there's any concern as well as like your um, like TPO, AB, like your, your antibodies for thyroid health as well to see if potentially you have um, an autoimmune condition. But it's really, um, I always say uh, the thyroid is kind of like a canary in a um, coal mine. It's like, it's very sensitive and it can easily be swayed by stress. And it's kind of a, an alarm system for us that like other things are not well in our body. Um, and so it's really important to get like a full thyroid panel to really look at not just TSH, which is sometimes that's all doctors will order at first. And if you're within normal range then they're like, you're fine. So sometimes you have to ask for what you want and say, I'd like a full thyroid panel and even tell them what that means. Like I actually, cause this is the type of person, person I am when I do my annual blood work, I bring a list, I type it up. I say, this is what I want you to order because if I don't, there's been times where they leave something off and it was important for me that that's run. So, um, and in my course, I explain like a list of like, here's everything to ask your doctor to run for you. But as you mentioned with blood work, it's so important to get the full picture of your health. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So you mentioned some symptoms that you were going through on both ends, both the hypo and hyper. And I'd love if we could maybe just talk about those symptoms that maybe people and, and maybe even the less common symptoms, right? Because I think, you know, some of the more obvious, I think, are areas that you kind of brought up of like areas that people really are sensitive about or more emotional about versus like maybe those other symptoms that, you know, are showing up that they're not even paying attention to that you know, could be contributing to their uh, autoimmune disease. Absolutely. And hypo and hyperthyroidism, again, they have a lot of like a foundational similarities. Obviously with hypo, your body is going to be more on like the sluggish, slower side where hyper, your metabolism, your body's more revved up, but there are, um, it's still at the core, an imbalance with your thyroid. So for both people may um, have like hair loss or thinning hair. If you start, you know, after you shower, you're brushing your hair, you're just getting, you notice like that's a lot more hair than I normally lose. Um, we can actually lose up to a, a couple hundred strands of hair a day. So hair, it's not that hair loss in general is an indicator of a thyroid imbalance, but it's so important to be aware of what's normal for your body. If you start noticing a lot of extra hair loss, that potentially could be a thyroid imbalance, insomnia or difficulty sleeping. With hypothyroidism, um, a slowed heart rate or constipation because the body's really slowing down and so that can lend to constipation. Heavy periods, if you have like irregular periods or really heavy periods, um, a lot of blood clotting, for people with hypothyroidism as well, there can be a lot of fatigue and sometimes that can be related to iron deficiency. Um, it can be common for people who have hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism to also be deficient in iron, which can also lend to feeling very tired. Um, so, you know, with the hypothyroidism, the body is just more sluggish, the metabolism is slowed, and that's going to really show up in more like depression, constipation. You may just feel like it's so hard to get out of bed in the morning everything is so much effort. It's just like, you just feel like it's, everything's really hard because the body is really slowed down. For hyper, you may, um, you know, your heart rate may be faster. You may feel your heart beating faster, a uh, higher heart rate, but also higher pulse. That can also lend to just more anxiety feeling or that pa like panicky, like panic attack feeling as well. Um, sweating, those are symptoms that, you know, I had, I didn't have many, but with the hyperthyroidism, that was something that I had was like the elevated heart rate. Like I could feel it beating, um, at times and just like, then that would lend to me sweating, getting really hot all of a sudden with hypo, you may feel cold more often with hyper, you may feel like you're easily overheating. Um, and so I'm trying to think if there's, you know, a couple other symptoms with hyper that I can, can refer to, uh, diarrhea can also be with hyperthyroidism, because again, your body's just moving so much faster that that's lending to the food going through your body faster, which again, either side, diarrhea or constipation um, is not ideal and it's not good for your body um, with helping with detoxification or just being able to get all the nutrients you need out of your food. So if this, if, the, if this is something you're noticing, like, oh, I'm feeling really anxious, but it's only for a day or two, maybe it's more an isolated situation. But one thing I really advocate people do is keep a wellness journal. If you're feeling like something's off, start putting dates. And when that, that symptom happens, just jot it down. Maybe anything else that's happened before that, that may be associated with it. 
it's really helpful for yourself to see patterns of your symptoms because then you can identify, oh, well, that really stressful thing was happening in my life and that was causing my diarrhea. And once I feel better about that, my digestion's better. Or if this is like a chronic symptom you're experiencing. And also when you go to the doctor's office, often people get nervous and stressed. There's a lot of conversation. They may ask you questions and it's hard. Um, or like if someone's working with you, like it's sometimes hard in your mind to recall the duration of things. But if you can have a little bit of a record of saying, oh, well, I notice I always have constipation, but it seems to be more around, you know, the week before my period, or like you can kind of try to piece together what's going on with your body. So I've, I feel like that's been really helpful for me at times is just keeping a journal of my symptoms and to kind of see also if there's improvement as well. Okay, I was having this, but now it's almost every other day. Well, now it's only once a week. And so that's that can be really helpful with um, just really getting to know your body and the process of your health. Yeah, that, that's great advice. And I will say the, the biggest turning point for me in my gut healing journey was when I started journaling. And it wasn't, we're not talking meticulous calorie counting or everything I put in my mouth. It was what changed this week? Was it the stress? Was it finals week? Was it did I go through a breakup? Or did I start a new supplement? You know, like, I, I really encourage clients to do this, even clients that aren't working with me in, in a monthly program where I don't check their journals every day, I still have them do it because I tell them, like you just said, it's really empowering and you want to make those connections and be able to, to try to see those trends. It's, it's very, very powerful. You mentioned the SIBO conversation, right? So the hypothyroid, and this is a, this is a reason that I see SIBO patients relapse over and over again is because they're not addressing underlying thyroid issues. And so for those who aren't aware, if you have hypothyroid, as Megan said, you're going to see slower digestion. So motility is going to be a lot slower. That's going to put you at an increased risk of that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So if you're someone who's had reoccurrent SIBO, definitely worth looking into your thyroid function. Mm -hmm, for sure. So research shows that there's so many GI disorders that are associated with thyroid dysfunction, including autoimmune thyroid, but also hyper hypothyroid. There's also, I did a whole episode on GI issues associated with autoimmune disease in general, right? And so offline, we were talking about how the gut is connected to everything. I think you said the domino effect, right? It's connected to everything. Now, I think something that's really common is for patients to use medications for thyroid and I think there's obviously benefits to certain medications and, and we want to use them when they're necessary, but what would be your concerns as someone who takes a very holistic approach about the use of medications as a first line of treatment in every single case? Yes, that's a, a good question. And I think for people who do want to take a holistic approach, I think it's also important to I mean, maybe and this is just me speaking, but I, I feel like there can be a little bit of a stigma or a, a guilt or a feel, feeling of failure if you do go on medication. And so I never want anyone to feel bad about the choice of medication, because if your symptoms are just really awful, sometimes people need medication just to get them in a place where they can feel better to then start implementing these healthy changes and work on themselves. So there is a time when maybe medication is going to be the best fit for you. Um, but even if you take medication, it's really important to not have that be the end all be all to supporting your thyroid health, because the medication is not getting to the root cause of why your thyroid wasn't balanced in the first place. And even if you're on medication, taking a more comprehensive approach or a more holistic approach, focusing on gut health, liver health, adrenal health, stress reduction, reducing your toxic load, like there's so many things that impact thyroid health that can also help you feel significantly so much better, can help get to the root cause of your thyroid imbalance, help your body be back in balance. And then maybe if it is your goal, you can come off medication in the future because it's no longer something you need because you've actually restored your body to be back within balance. So even if someone's on medication, it's still so important to really learn about their health, like learn about thyroid health, learn about their body. And one of, you know, and continuously talking about uh, journaling, it's like one of the best things we can really do is learn about like what is true for us. Like what is true for me personally? I know that me personally, stress is one of my biggest triggers because when I look back at 
all the times when my thyroid was out of balance or then I had rosacea or then I had SIBO, it always happened after a very stressful time in my life. And so obviously there's other factors in there, but stress to me is something that's a huge trigger. So I know that's in addition to nutrition and all these other things, that's one of the biggest things that I work on in my life is my nervous system and my parasympathetic nervous system and sleep and all the things I can do to have a better response to stress. And we only know that if we can look at ourselves and take the time to really get to know ourselves. Um, but in, you know, answering your question in about medication, as I said, there are times when medication is needed, but it's still really important to do the work of learning about why is my, why did I have a thyroid imbalance in the first place? Is it heavy metals? Do I have gut dysbiosis and really working to uncover, you know, the root cause. Excellent. And, and it's, and it's empowering, you know, to know that you don't have to put all your eggs in one basket, right? You can focus a little bit on stress management. You can focus a little bit on diet. You know, if someone's feeling overwhelmed by all this information, which is completely understandable. I mean, we're sitting here as very knowledgeable dietitians who have made this our journeys, right? Out of careers, out of our journeys. And this has been where we spend most of our time researching. But for someone who is new to all of this, I mean, of course, you have this wonderful resource coming out and, you know, I do coaching and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, try to just think of one thing that you can do at a time to change. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, a whole module in my course called reducing the toxic load, just going through, cause there's, there's layers to health, right? I almost look at it as like a, a pyramid of like, because there's so many things we can do. So we can maybe switch to, um, you know, an aluminum free deodorant, but is that the most important thing that's going to have the biggest impact on, on our thyroid health? thyroid health, or should I first start with gut health? Because there's, there's going to be things once we run tests and we figure out where our balances and balances are, there's going to be areas of our health and changes we can make that are going to have the biggest impact of our health. And then there's things we can layer on top of that, but it's like, yes, sure. that is a healthy change, but that alone is not going to have as big of an impact on helping your thyroid as if you did this over here. And so mm -hmm. in the toxic, reducing your toxic load um, module, that's something I talk about is like, after listening to this module, after learning about all these different areas, you know, where we're exposed to different toxins and in specifically, what are the different things that can impact thyroid health? Like just start with one or two things. Like, what are you going to like today or tomorrow? And then as that feels like really comfortable for you, you can add on to that because there's so, and it's, it's almost, um, never ending, right. All the healthy things we can do. You go down this journey of like constantly trying to make swaps to be healthier. And it really can get to a point too, where it can become then stressful feeling like everything is out to get you. And so there's a balance of like making small changes, but also giving yourself a lot of grace and not letting the stress of, it, and it doesn't have to be perfect either. Like you don't have to eat perfectly or live a perfectly healthy life to, to be healthy, um, which sometimes I feel like the health world can, can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> sure. I'm sure a lot of people can, can relate to that. Yeah. Now the gut thyroid connection, right? So we, we've kind of alluded to the fact that there is a lot of research out there. This is not something that we're just speculating or that, you know, we are kind of hoping resolves once we address gut issues. This is well-documented, the research that the gut and the thyroid are definitely connected in several different ways between nutrient absorption and activation of thyroid enzymes. And so I, I would love to hear from you about kind of what, what this connection even is and what are some of like the big things that we see in research are associated between the gut and thyroid? Yes, well, gut dysbiosis, um you know, there's so many ways that your gut can be out of balance, but is a huge, I mean, pretty much almost, I wouldn't say almost everyone, you can never be so absolute, absolute, but most people who have a thyroid condition have some level of gut dysbiosis. It's so common in our modern like day and age, modern lifestyle with just stress and, and food. And so it's so important to look at gut health for thyroid health for a number of reasons, especially, you know, there's the, the thyroid health, and then also looking at the autoimmune component of it as well. But, you know, one of the biggest things is that we have these different thyroid hormones. We have T4 and we have T3. And while most of the conversion of our inactive thyroid hormone T4, as it converts into T3 happens in the liver. So liver health is also an area that is really 
sometimes people are like, who want, who cares about liver health? Like that doesn't sound fun, but it's so important. Like the liver is such an important organ and a huge part of your thyroid hormone conversions happen in the liver. About 20% of it happens in the gut. So it's also important that we're supporting gut health because if your T4 or your T3 levels are off, that also could be potentially because of gut health. And we actually need healthy gut bacteria for that conversion to take place. So if you have, for example, like me, SIBO, like my thyroid numbers were all off, but my SIBO, I had like my methane gas was like through the roof. And I'm like, this answers so many questions for me. And so it, you know, by fixing that, that was so important in helping with my, I had also um, like intestinal permeability or like leaky gut, like working on all of that um, is so important for, for thyroid health and those thyroid hormones. And in terms of, I'm sure you're, you know, so aware of leaky gut, but, um, in terms of the autoimmune component as well, you know, with those, those tight junctions, when they become loose and there can be like those microscopic particles that enter in the bloodstream that can also cause that kind of auto that, that immune response. And then essentially where the body attacks is where then that disease gets its label. So if your body's then attacking your thyroid, then that's a thyroid, you know, autoimmune condition. So by really helping heal the gut lining, and there's so many different supplements and foods and reducing stress, there's so many things that we can do to support gut health. Um, it better supports immune health, and it also better supports thyroid function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the, the one thing that I feel like every client comes to when, when I have a stool test result for them is they just want to know if they have leaky gut. They're, they've heard all the yeah. scary things about it online. And it's like, yeah, but leaky gut is never isolated. Like there's a reason why the tight junctions are loose and that zonulin is higher. There's so many other things that play into that. So I would also caution people for going and Googling leaky gut remedies or what to eat for leaky gut, because as Megan and I are talking about here today, it's that the whole system is connected, but leaky gut is absolutely a huge driver of autoimmune disease and food sensitivities and, and skin issues too, right? Rosacea, psoriasis, you name it, acne. Um, I see this very often, including in addition to um, H. pylori overgrowth, which has been linked to Hashimoto's. So testing can be really helpful in terms of gut health and the SIBO breath testing. I use this a lot for SIBO. Is this the type of test that you took for your SIBO? Unfortunately, I did not. I, I love that they say it's a simple home breath test, but it's like, um, I mean, I don't want to scare any, anyone away from taking it because it's just the best way to test for your SIBO. So it's just one of those things where I was like, I just have to like be a grown up and I have to do this, even though I don't like it. But um, yeah, but because you have to eat a certain way before you take the test, um, which was hard for me and then fast while you're taking the test, which was hard for me. Um, but I did it. I did it twice because I did it to test. And then after we did all the work, I wanted to see, did all my efforts pay off? Um, I hope I never have to take it again. I will if I have to, but yeah, the SIBO home breath test is, is what I used. Yeah. And when I, when I tested, I don't, I don't remember how old I was, but I was young and I don't think they had at home tests at the time. So I remember like them telling me how long this was going to be and a, yeah, that I had to be fasted. So I oh. went into the hospital to get this done and I'm sitting there, I like brought a book because I'm like, this is going to be a while. And the nurse would just call me up every interval, have me breathe into the tube. But no, mm -hmm. it's not fun. But it's like you said, it's the most accurate way to assess the different types of gases that are being produced and help determine if you have SIBO. And, and now it's great that we have these at home tests. And the Trio Smart, for example, is a great test that looks at all three types of different gases, not just methane and hydrogen, but hydrogen sulfide. And so we're getting better and better, you know, in terms of testing and diagnosing, um, no test is usually completely foolproof, but that is, if you suspect you have SIBO, a home breath test or with your GI doc is going to be the best way for you to figure that out. And testing is so, even though it's annoying and it costs money and it's frustrating, it's just so important because you can spend hours of time, energy, emotion, and money trying to puzzle piece together and remedy your own health from going online and trying to figure it out. And you may be working on things that aren't even an issue for you, or you don't actually have a deficiency in that, you know, nutrient, but now you're taking a supplement for it. So it's really not doing anything for you. So that's why it's like, just start with, 
you know, comprehensive blood work, testing in certain areas, because then you can really then target your, your protocol and your treatment to where your body really needs it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, so you talked about the leaky gut, talked about like immune function in the gut, what about, and the activation of, you know, reverse T3, those types of inactive hormones that are important for thyroid function. Um, what about, so I would love to just have the listeners understand the nutrient absorption component, because we talked about this kind of in the thyroid gut connection, but it, the importance of the absorption of certain nutrients and maybe a few specific nutrients that are really important for thyroid function and why the gut is important for that. If that question is clear, I know I've <laughs> rambled a little bit. Hi, it sounds really nerdy to be like, I have a favorite nutrient for thyroid health. <laughs> it's a great nutrient. You're going to get really excited about it. Um, so selenium is such a really important nutrient for thyroid health because it also is needed for that conversion of T4 to T3. Um, and there are also are studies that show that a deficiency in selenium can also be associated with hypothyroidism. So selenium can be found um, in a lot of different foods, um, you know, pumpkin seeds. One of my favorite ways to eat um, selenium is with Brazil nuts. Um, so about two Brazil nuts per day can, you know, depending on the size of the Brazil nuts, not going to be precise, but um, can be about 200 micrograms of selenium. And there's also studies that show like if you are someone who also has um, like antibodies, um, like thyroid antibodies, there's been studies that show that 200 micrograms of selenium per day can also help reduce antibody levels for people with Hashimoto's as well. So it's not only important for the thyroid hormone conversions, but also can potentially help people lower their antibody levels also. So it's a really, you know, easy thing to do. I just keep my Brazil nuts in the fridge. Every time I open my fridge, they're right there. It reminds me I eat two a day. Um, and that's just such a simple, but very, very consistent, impactful way that, um, you know, one of the key nutrients that someone needs for supporting immune health. Zinc is also important for immune function. Um, vitamin D is important. Um, iron can potentially be important as well because, because of how common iron deficiency can be as well for people who have hypothyroidism in particular. So that is important to test your iron levels and your ferritin levels as part of doing your blood work also. Iodine is one that people often talk about because iodine is also needed um, for the creation of thyroid hormones, but it's a little bit of a tricky one because for some people, and I actually personally experienced this, I always, I'm just like, there's got to be a reason that I've gone through so many frustrating things. And maybe this is why right now I can talk about it with other people. Um, but for some people, actually, if it's, it's also good to test for iodine, because if you do not actually have an iodine deficiency, just adding in a bunch of iodine is not necessarily going to be beneficial for you. In fact, it can make it worse for some people who have hypo or hyperthyroidism. And, um, you know, my, I never want to say anything bad about my ND. She's great. But sometimes there's a bit of an educated guess of like, what's going to be the best supplement for you. And so the supplement that I was on, um, had a high amount of iodine in it. And when I went back and checked my levels, my TSH was like really, really high, which if your TSH is high, then that means hypo, which is kind of the opposite. It's like when it's high, that means you're low. When it's low, it means you're high, um, hyper. But I was like, the only thing that's changed is this supplement that has like 20,000% of my iodine in a day. And I just told her, I was like, I'm going to stop taking the supplement and we're going to retest my thyroid in, you know, six weeks or something like that. Give myself a little bit of time. And sure enough, I went back and it went, you know, way down. And so sometimes, um, you know, that's obviously in a supplement and supplements are really where we can see more problems like that. Um, you know, food sources of iodine can be like seaweed. I know so many people love like seaweed snacks. My kids just love them and just could eat them all the time. I keep being like, it's good for your thyroid, but in my head as a dietitian, but I'm like, but not too much. I would never say that to them because I'm not that kind of mom, you know, yeah. but I want everyone to have any like food, weird food things. It's very important to me that they have a healthy relationship with food, but it's funny having kids, all the dietitian thoughts you have, you know, as they're eating. You know too much. We know too much. <laughs> On a tangent, sometimes the kids will be like, I need a little snack with protein. It's like, what the <laughs> I work with families like we work like work with the parents obviously but the kids are involved and I hear things like that and it just makes me like it makes my heart so happy because it's like 
it, they're, it's a healthy relationship with food, as you mentioned, like we're always fostering that, but when they know and they can make those associations and they feel so proud of their, themselves. So that's so cute. I love that. So cute. Kids. And I won't keep talking about my kids, but they're, they like eat all day long. And my son yesterday was like, cause he's three and you know, three-year-olds have emotions. And he was like, I just want to lay in bed and eat all day. <laughs> I was like, you too, bud, but we can't do that. What so, a sweet boy. <laughs> yeah, my highly sensitive you know emotional boy who just eats it's like oh and when you eat somewhat healthy too like them I always tell my husband I was like their antioxidant load is like through the roof because they just eat bowls of like wild frozen blueberries and just like it's just so funny um they just eat bowls of beans like sometimes for a snack all they want is just like a big bowl of black beans and I'm like sure sounds great every parent's dream yeah. So funny, but, um, but anyways, and you know, back to iodine, that was the tangent was the seaweed snacks. Um, mm -hmm. it's something just to be mindful of too, with, with iodine, that if you have hypothyroidism and you don't actually have an iodine deficiency, then it, you don't really need to be obsessively trying to add more iodine into your diet, because if you're not deficient in it, it's not going to make a big change in maybe your TSH or your T4 or T3. And it's, you know, in the course, we have modules that talk about this too, is, really learning like what do the different levels mean because if because once you know for example like reverse t3 is often a sign of stress and it's basically your body trying to like put on the brakes if you're in you know state of stress so when i see that with my you know if i see it there you know in the past like a higher level of reverse t3 sometimes when we can help reduce our stress levels that can tell our body like hey we're not in the state of fight or flight anymore you don't have to be in the state of like, you know, we're using up all of our reserves. So it's just really helpful to not just see the blood work and just, it's just, you know, lab numbers, but really understand like they each mean something. They mean something of what's going on in your body and learn, you know, like with T4 and T3, like the conversion of those are happening in the gut and in the liver. So holistically, it really is interesting to learn how when we can understand what the numbers mean, what they do, when they're out of balance, why, and where in the body we can support to help bring them back into balance, I think is just so empowering as a person to just really understand your health and how your body works. Cause our bodies are amazing and what they can do. And they're always on our side. You know, they always want to be healing and restoring and they want to, our body wants to be in a state of balance. It's, it's rooting for us. And so it's so, I, I mean, maybe this is just the nerdy dietitian in me, but I think it's so fascinating to really understand like our own body and what our body needs and just how our body works in general. So again, tangent, but back to the iodine, just being mindful of any supplements really that, you know, if you hear, oh, I need selenium, I need um, magnesium, zinc, you know, instead of just going out and getting all these supplements and taking them, it's just good first to do blood work, work with a dietitian, work with your doctor to really assess like what your body actually personally needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And social media can be really toxic for these types of, inf this type of information, because you will see things like Megan just said, like, these are the top nutrients for thyroid. And as just mentioned, if you go eat a whole thing of seaweed snacks and you have Hashimoto's disease without an iodine deficiency, you might feel a lot worse and you could be doing more harm than good. And, and there's a lot of supplements out there. I mean, I, I'm meeting with a patient right now who's very young and she was even working with a naturopath and they had her on two different supplements, both that contain iodine and they were at extremely high levels. And, and this poor thing, you know, at such a young age. Um, so you really have to be checking your supplement labels and seeing what's in it. There's hair growth supplements, there's mood supplements that have ingredients that you never would even think, you know, could be impacting your thyroid. Yeah, and, and it's, it's so good that you point that out because even protein powders may have a ton of vitamins added to them and we don't need, you know, some people take a multivitamin, but then there's all these vitamins added into other things and your body's getting too much. And back to selenium, you know, it's the upper limit is really around like 400 micrograms. So for me, I know how much selenium is in my multivitamin and then with my Brazil nuts. And it's like, and then there's selenium, you know, in other foods as well, legumes, we eat a lot of beans. So it's like, it's just important to know also that more is not always better. And if you're buying a protein powder or you're buying something, like I prefer a protein powder that doesn't have vitamin. I, I don't need more vitamins and minerals in everything that I buy. Sometimes it'll be like a drink and there's like all these vitamins in it. It's like, no, this, 
have it be just the thing without trying to always add more to it. Cause most people take a multivitamin and they're, and if you're eating well, like, you know, unless again, if you have a, a condition, maybe you need nutrient support in certain areas, but a multivitamin eating well, um, is going to provide you a lot of the nutrients that you need. Agreed. Yeah. We, the wellness culture is almost too much, right? We forget that our body also can absorb a 3 million things in one protein powder. So when I, when mm -hmm. a client says, what do you think about this? Or I get a message, what do you think about this? I'm like, the ingredients list is so long, you know? So especially with digestive issues, it's like, how, how would you even begin to pinpoint what could be causing issues for you if the supplement has 30 greens powders, digestive enzymes, adaptogens, you know, it, like you said, get whey protein <laughs> and add some flavor to it in the smoothie, you know, just try to simplify things as much as you can. Um, so you mentioned some foods, you mentioned pumpkin seeds, you mentioned Brazil nuts and, and seaweed. Um, are there any other foods or even herbs that someone could bring into their diet to support optimal thyroid function? It doesn't necessarily have to be like someone that has a thyroid condition, but if they're just thinking about like maybe fertility or mental health or gut health, like what are some general foods that maybe are more so essential versus like, you know, for specific conditions, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I love this. This can like go into a whole nother topic. I have like 10 things I can do right now. I love herbs. Like I'm not a credentialed herbalist, but in my heart I am because I love herbs so much. So we'll talk about that. I'm drinking herb. I like to make all sorts of herbal concoctions. Um, one other nutrient that's really important is omega-3. Oh yes. I love it. I'm Today's herbal health. This is the book. I, I have a few herbal books, but this is oh, one I that I really like. That one, so you're going to have to send that one to me. Yes, I will send it to you for sure. But keep going. I'm sorry. I just got excited because it was sitting next to me. Yes, I love, I love herbal health. Um, Omega threes is really important as well, because for people who have stress, stress can really trigger inflammation. People who have chronic inflammation that is negative for our gut health. Really inflammation is a precursor for a lot of health conditions. Um, and so omega-3s are really helpful for helping to reduce inflammation. So things like walnuts, um, fatty fish, like salmon, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, avocados, um, adding in, you know, you, you some people may want to take an omega-3 supplement, like a fish oil supplement, um, but eating a lot of omega-3 rich foods as well. It's, it's good for heart health. It's good for brain health, but it's also really, really good for helping reduce inflammation, which inflammation, um, again, can just from our, our, especially a lot of people live in a chronic stress, state of stress, even if we don't feel chronically stressed all the time, just the way our world is, there's just, there's stress. And so it's, there's also a lot of foods you can eat to help your body, you know, during times of stress. So that's another one that's really important for thyroid health, but also reducing inflammation is omega-3s. And then with herbal health too, um, back to, so there's, there's specific herbs that you can take that can help if you have more so on the hyperthyroidism side, specifically for helping with kind of that anxiety, um, like lemon balm is one that's really great. You can do tincture, um, you can do lemon balm tea. Um, I also really like holy basil, also known as Tulsi, which is really, it's great. It has equally like a calming, but also a little bit of an energizing component to it. Um, chamomile is good. I love hibiscus because that's also really anti-inflammatory also. Um, I said chamomile. I, I, every night I do like a chamomile ginger tea. Um, in the day, I usually like some type of like ginger. I do a lot of ginger. <laughs> ginger or um, like right now I'm drinking a blend of, because I like loose leaf because then I can get like making all my concoctions. So I have all right here, like my, I know people listening can't see this, but if you're watching on YouTube, Erin uh, also has a YouTube channel. So go subscribe. Um, I have a little like tea thing and I can put, you know, teaspoon of this, a teaspoon of that, and then add it in my cup and just be like, today I have Tulsi and, um, chamomile in there, but it's just really great when you can also learn about nutrition and learn about herbs. Um, ashwagandha is also another, it's an, an adaptogen, but can also be really helpful for people, um, with hypothyroidism. And all of these herbs really that have more of like the calming effect, um, whether you have hypothyroidism, even though you're already kind of sluggish, but we all, especially if you have hyperthyroidism, but we all really can benefit from herbs that are going to help our nervous system just to be calmer. And a lot of us, again, live in a state of like fight or flight, there's lots of stress, um, and that really can take a toll on our health. And so 
Um, I briefly mentioned this in the beginning, but like meditation, finding ways to de-stress, going on a walk, whatever are the things that really can help you feel calm, spending time in nature. Um, but sometimes we can't do that, right? We can't take a one hour nature walk, but we can make ourselves a cup of Tulsi tea or chamomile tea and sip on that while we're doing our work. So I think it's so important to find like the little health hacks that like, cause it's, it's not always about these big grand gestures for our health. Sometimes it's like the small consistent things we do every day. Like I make multiple cups of tea every day and different herbal teas. And I know that that's hydrating my body. It's giving my body different nutrients. And I just run as a naturally more like go, go anxious. Let's get it done. What are we going to do person? Like go for it person. And so my body just benefits from having things that kind of help me chill out a little bit more. Um, there, I, you know, and you may, because you own a line of CBD products, you may be able to look into this more or know more about this, but I also take CBD before I go to sleep. And that's something that, um, you know, not there are, cause there's a lot of things we can do that maybe there's not like a, a research study that shows a direct correlation between if I take this, it directly is going to help my thyroid health, but my approach to health is really the holistic approach. So overall, like all the things we do, it's all going to impact um, our health and our thyroid health. So that's something that I don't know, maybe it's been two years now. Um, I started taking CBD and I, I was very hesitant about it for a long time because there's a lot of stigma around things like that. That and I'm just like, I wish I started sooner because it was so beneficial for me for just sleep and just sleeping better. Um, and I usually just take it at night, but if I'm like, you know, solo parenting with my kids and we're in the car and we got stuff to do and I'm feeling a little bit stressed, like even like five milligrams of something or 10 milligrams is just enough. Like I am, it doesn't make me sleepy. It doesn't make me incapable of parenting in any component. It just takes the edge off. So I'm actually like, just calmer and like happier and able to handle what's in front of me. Um, so again, it's finding the things that work for you um, because there's so many really wonderful natural options out there from CBD or from different herbal teas, foods we eat. There's just so much, it's such a world to explore of how to support our health, which is a long winded way <laughs> of answering your question, but no. there's probably a lot of other podcasts all about herbs because it is like, it's just such a passion of mine. I couldn't agree more. And I will say, I just wish we lived closer instead of opposite posts, uh, because I have this whole tea set up. It's, it's a fairly new thing for me, the loose leaf. And it's like, I get so excited to go in and make my own blends. And like, you think about the benefits of each thing. And um, so, yeah, I think we'd be best friends if we, if we lived closer. <laughs> I, had this, I had my little glass jars because when you get loose leaf I always get like you get a ton right like you're set for a long time I have to have like the storage thing and then the glass you know yeah. area so you have yeah I in my pantry and I'm just afraid that like my husband or the kids are gonna be like what's this and like you know three pounds of just like chamomile is gonna come down on their face um, but it is really fun. And I think that's, it's, you know, it's important that you enjoy what you're eating. You enjoy your food because it's, that's part of wellness is just like happiness too, and your mindset and positivity. And I know there's also a lot of, um, you know, evidence for this too, of just how important it is like our mental health in the connection with our physical health. And so in a healing journey, and like, if you have to make dietary changes, it can be really overwhelming and stressful people for people at first, if they have to eat so differently than what they're used to. Um, so it is important to have it be like a journey and find recipes or foods or things that you do enjoy and that you do get excited about. Cause that's important to like have that like excitement and love and enjoyment for what you're drinking and what you're eating. That's so important. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Coming back to the CBD too. So with CBD, yeah, the, there's so much research that's not being funded about what we could could know about CBD, but we've got the endocannabinoid system, right? Which has receptors all over the body and, and the different cannabinoids, not just CBD, but CBG and CBN and THCA. They interact with those receptors and they can reduce inflammation and basically bring a gland back to better balance, which is incredible. And, and that's you know, you think like, oh, she's a gut health dietitian. Why does she have CBD on her line? That was the first thing that I put on my line because my journey to gut healing was nervous system was like a huge missing piece of my protocol through SIBO, Candida, all of it. And the same as you, when I started using it, it was 
just that little bit to get me through the day and make my entire like nervous system get exactly what it needed. And I was like, I need to share this with people because it's it, people don't talk about the gut stress connection or they don't put enough emphasis on it. And then I just came out with a stress supplement that has ashwagandha because that was another herb that I personally used for so long and very similar to CBD. These things aren't like stimulants making you feel like super energized and like not like yourself. These are herbs that bring your body to balance, that they they adapt with your body. And I just love how much of a holistic approach you've taken. You've made it clear that this course that you've created is addressing mind, body, spirit, nutrition, relationship with food. And that is that is what healing should look like. And I'm, I'm excited for the people that get to take your course and reap all of these amazing benefits. Because unfortunately, I see this every day, people go to practitioners, or they spend money on things. And they're not getting that type of care or resource for these types of things that can be life changing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And as you mentioned with, yeah, two things to say with the CBD, it it is amazing how it just kind of, for me, makes me the person like I want to be like, I'm able to not be so like in my head or anxious about things. Um, and just to be more present and to more be more calm. And I'm a really sensitive person. I don't even drink um, caffeine anymore, because I just noticed that it was making me so anxious. Um, and I just I wasn't like the mother and the wife, like I just I don't like feeling easily agitated by things and cutting out caffeine. I just felt like I'm just so much more like Zen and calm and not as easily ruffled by things. And the caffeine was just like too stimulating for my system. I drink like decaf now, like a always get water processed, um, decaf now, but, um, but in, you know, when it comes to things, so I am really sensitive. So if anyone's ever like, oh, I'm not sure about you know, ashwagandha or CBD. It's like, it, as you mentioned, it's not something that's gonna make you like be all a different person than you are. If anything, I feel like it makes you like the person that you should be, like not the stressed out, anxious, on edge, agitated person, but it allows your body to just kind of be more calm so that then you can actually enjoy and be present and, and logically think through you know the things you have to deal with. So there's, you know, and for some people, maybe don't want to do CBD, there are other options like ashwagandha or um, holy basil. I mean, they're going to, they're different, but it's not like there's only one thing that you can take in a more natural route that's going to be supportive for your nervous system. So it's, it's sometimes good to see, like try something and see how, how it works for your body or try something else. But um, I also really love ashwagandha too. Mm -hmm. Now, now selfish question. Um, because you've shared your journey and it's so inspiring and so many things are relatable and I'm sure for other people feel the same way. But so you mentioned your, your pregnancy journey, right? And you can't use a lot of these things during pregnancy. So I'm just curious, um, what, was there anything that helped you through pregnancy? Like with the stress of everything, especially you knowing and identifying how big of a, uh, an impact stress has on your system. Just curious. Oh man, I didn't start with, I did the lemon balm and those things prior to getting pregnant. Um, I didn't start CBD for really getting, I mean, I was to chamomile tea and stuff, but I didn't really get into the adaptogens. Um, Oh, I don't know if you're into like mushrooms, but I'm really into learning about like mushrooms, like lion's mane and crooked tail and reishi. It's like, I had a mushroom farmer on my podcast and he's been doing this since like the 1920s or something like that and he uh, awesome awesome yeah. so I'll, yeah Jeff, Jeff Chilton he's uh go check him out if you want to learn more about mushrooms he's an absolute mushroom king <laughs> well, it's, I just love it I love that there are these things out there for us that um are good for us and then they just help us um so but I didn't really get into a lot of these things until I actually was like done breastfeeding and it's So I I don't know, like, you know, looking back, I feel like what would I have, like what I take, what I had taken CBD through my pregnancy, through my breastfeeding, because I really struggled with postpartum anxiety, um, really bad after my daughter was born, postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, which it just saddens me because when you have that, it steals a lot of your joy from being able to really enjoy those early days because I was so worried about everything. And it's part of it. It's like, 
you caught you you know like you know that you're you know obsessing over the temperature of the house or every little noise your baby makes in the room like you're you're aware of it but it's like if you just are that way it's like there's really nothing you can do to change it your body is just that way so you know in some ways I I wasn't meditating there's so many things that through the journey of having very hard I actually had good pregnancies but postpartum was really hard for me like the sleep deprivation the changes of hormones um they're really hard for me and so in many ways I wish that I wish that I had someone who said like, Hey, it looks like you're having a hard time. Have you, you know, looked into meditation or this, or like a health professional, because, you know, I, I actually had midwives and they were amazing and they were super supportive, but I still just kind of felt like, Oh, postpartum anxiety. It's kind of like a rite of passage, or it happens to a lot of people, or, you know, I just didn't. I didn't know how to take care of myself, especially the first time around. The second time around, I was much better at advocating for what I needed um, and being like, again, like, this is true of me. I know I'm a very anxious person postpartum, so I know I need more support. So like after my daughter was born, we thought we wanted no one around us to be in this like baby bliss. And I remember we, I was like crying. I called my mother-in-law like eight o'clock at night, the second night. And we're like, we need your help. And she's such an angel. She got on a plane the next day, came out. It was just it was so overwhelming for us. So the second time around having already had a child and then have this new baby, I was like, I just need, we need more support. And so she stayed with us for like a month, which she, again, is just an angel. And, but just know, again, it all comes back to like knowing yourself. And sometimes you don't, get to know yourself until you've gone through those really hard times to be like, okay, so when I'm like that, I like, I don't want to be that kind of person. So what do I need to do to help me? So it's been a journey for me. It's not like just because I'm a dietitian that I've always done these things or I've always known what to do. I've really had to just, it's like a layering of, of health. And, you know, for me, like one of the, the, the new, not really new, I guess I've been doing it for um, well, almost a year now consistently. I used to meditate on and off, but I, I'm very motivated by numbers. So I have an app that like tells me how much I've meditated. And I'm like at like 264 days or something, um, like consecutively, which is wonderful. Um, but I like meditate. I do like guided meditations. Cause again, it just is like, helps you take a moment to just like breathe and like, just relax your forehead and your eyes and your shoulders and just like relax your whole body and take time to breathe. And we just don't do that in our day. We just go from one thing to the next. And we don't realize when we're stressed, we take short, shallow breaths. We are, you know, are hunched with our shoulders and, and we keep everything clenched and stressed. And so just like letting your belly, like not be tense and like just relaxing everything. It's just so good for you. So again, it's a layering of things. And with pregnancy, I wasn't, you know, other than like chamomile tea, I really didn't do anything. I just lived in it and it was really hard and I wish I had better systems to support myself then um but I'm I'm all I can be is like well I am here now and I know now you know I, I feel like I'm the healthiest I have been now for so long because of all the things I've learned through the hardships um so you know that's all there's always like a message out of the mess there's always something that can be you know it's really hard when we go through these health ailments that can be really stressful, really frustrating, like why me? And it's all this work and all this money. But sometimes on the other side of it, it's like, but I look, look at all these things I learned about my body and I learned about myself and now all these things I get to implement. And now I'm, I'm healthier than I was before I even had this stuff because of all I've learned through it. Mm -hmm. And now you're helping other people and developing a course. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I, most of the dietitians that I talk to have gone through you know gone through it basically and and have come out the other side to now help other people and share their journey and I also love that you shared how human you are and how just because you're a dietitian doesn't mean everything's perfect and I would I would definitely emulate that as well it's um it's a beautiful thing so yeah well last question before we uh go is well, first of all, your course comes out when? Uh, January 1st is okay. course is live and anyone and everyone can sign up for it. 
Um, and then I, we also have our thyroid balance cookbook. Um, it's an e-cookbook. It has 50 um, recipes that are all gluten-free. Um, they are dairy-free. And there are, I also give tips of specific recipes, like if you're hyperthyroidism, swap this for this. Or if you're hypo, maybe try this for that. Um, but they're just good, like wholesome, nourishing recipes. They're things that I have been making for years um, that have just been really helpful for me in keeping my thyroid condition in remission. Um, and also, you know, most of the recipes are quite easily adaptable if you want to change a protein source or alter something. But um, so there's the cookbooks. There's also a five guided meditation pack. So there are guided meditations. It's me talking in a very calm and soothing voice to music. Um, you have just, a very calming voice. I feel like I'm a very like energetic. Um, I'm excited. I want to talk about mushrooms and herbs. Um, but <laughs> it's it was actually interesting recording that because you know wanting to be very calm, it was like almost so soft that you couldn't hear me. Um, so that was an interesting one. But um, but they're so helpful. Like I think meditation, almost like CBD, it's a little bit like what is this? Can I do this? Like that sounds like something I'm not into, but it's just one of those things where I just encourage someone like, just, just try it, like listen to a guided meditation. Um, if you want to listen to one of mine before you get it for, for like, before you buy it, if you want to listen to one for free, I'm happy to share one of them for free for you to like test it out and listen to. Cause it's just one of those things that once you start doing it, you like look forward to it. And it's just such a little reset in your day. That's so nice. But the course is like the main main program that we have. So it is a 12 module, video module guided, um, like self-paced guided program. Um, it's all online, but it's very, very comprehensive. So it's, it is great for anyone with a thyroid condition, whether you have hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, whether it's Graves disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, subclinical hypothyroid, like any thyroid imbalance that you have, you can benefit from this course. And there's some modules that specifically talk more about if you have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Um, and then there's modules that talk about, you know, stress, um, um, adrenal health, liver health, hormonal health. There's a nutrition thyroid protocol, foods to eat, foods to avoid, a whole section on supplements. Um, it's just it's everything really that you need to know to have a really good foundation of knowing like, what is the thyroid? What does it do? What is its role in our body? What impacts thyroid health? How, what is being impacted if your thyroid is not within health and really all the things we can do from a real puzzle piece holistically to support thyroid health. And it's such a great just resource to just learn about. And, and some people are like, do I have to get this course only if I have a thyroid condition. And my answer to that is no, because one in eight women will develop a thyroid condition. So even if you're just someone who's interested in health and you want to be preventative with it, but also just learn too about uh, gut health, liver health, adrenal health, hormonal health, reducing your toxic load, like there's modules all about that as well. So it is geared towards thyroid health, but really it's just a really good foundation for supporting your health in general, because you know, as we briefly mentioned before we started recording, it's like health is like a domino, you know, effect. And if one thing's off, that can cause another thing to be off. So anyways, it's a really great program. Um, and, you know, if anyone has any questions, they can always email me or message me. And I'm always happy and happy to chat about it. Amazing. And the most important question is, what is your favorite childhood memory with food? Goodness. That's a good question. I didn't even, I don't like to prep people for it. Cause I feel like you have to see like the first thing that comes up. Okay. Well, okay. Can I say the first thing that comes up and be really, mm -hmm. really honest, which is so yeah. different. So my favorite thing as a kid is I used to love McDonald's when I was a kid and I'm like a nineties, a nineties child. I was born in the eighties, but more a child in the nineties. And, um, and I loved like getting the chicken nuggets. I love the cheeseburgers and just all those foods, like for, like the gushers, the, all that kind of stuff I ate, like growing up. Right. And it's so interesting that I'm just swung to a totally different side now of just more real whole foods. Um, but I remember loving all of that. I remember like, going camping with my family and we'd like stop by McDonald's in the morning and get like, I'm like, now I'm like, what a completely horrible breakfast for your blood sugar. Just like an orange juice and a hash brown, you know, like, like that is just, it's just so funny, but as you're just a kid and having fun. So, um, I love that. And I, I always also like enjoyed when my mom would make like a family dinner, like she would do like 
barbecued chicken or something. Um, and I don't know why, but family dinners to me are like really important. Um, and they're very important for so many reasons, but there's a lot of, not to just keep talking about things, but so much science behind family dinners and how important it is for, you know, bonding and relationships, but really good, healthy relationships with food for your kids. Such a good time to like role model healthy eating and sitting down and all eating like a healthy meal together. So it's really important for me and my kids that we all have like dinner together each day. Um, so I think, you know, I like to look back at those memories too, but I don't, I didn't, I mean, my mom healthy for us growing up was like homemade, even if the homemade was like filled with who knows what, um, like we knew we didn't have soda in the house. We knew that like fast food was fast food. We didn't think, you know, fast food was healthy, but, um, it is really interesting, you know, now how I eat compared to how I eat, how I ate as a child. But I just, that's the first thing when you said, what was your favorite food as a kid? I was like, I remember riding my bike to McDonald's and getting whatever I got and thinking I was going to win that monopoly. Like I just needed one more sticker and I would have become a millionaire. <laughs> so relatable. The gushers, everything that fruit roll up, you wrap it around your finger, like, uh, oh my goodness. Yeah. We had, we had, um, we had five and dime candies back then. Like it was, you save up all your allowance and go get candy. I was the same exact way swung in the complete opposite direction at my wedding. My mom gave that as part of, part of the wedding speech, but honestly, had I not had that, you know, it wouldn't probably be here now. I think, you know, you see, you know, a lot of different upbringings and relationship with food. And I think it was important for me to experience that. Now I know what that food tastes like, you know, and I, I don't necessarily miss it, but um, definitely good memories for sure. It is interesting being a mom and a dietitian because I, we could just probably talk for like five hours. So I'll make this <laughs> I had disordered eating when I was, it's like a whole nother topic, like late high school. And so I know what it's like to like not have a healthy relationship with food. And so it's very, very important for me that my kids have a good relationship with food, even though I am a dietitian and we eat very healthy, but it's like, I'm not someone who's like, you can't have sugar. Or if we go to a birthday party and I'm like, I know that that cupcake is filled with everything I wouldn't normally make for you, but it's like not a big deal. You know, it's at a birthday party, you're having fun. You so once in a while a thing, it gets really important for me that like, if we go out, the kids want ice cream. Like we, it's not, I, I, we never make, like they know that that's more like a treat than, you know, something that's like a more, <laughs> A protein or a wholesome option, but it's just really important for me that, because I had a friend who was a dietitian growing up and she could never eat sugar. She can never eat, you know, it was like, that was so bad. So then when she would go to her friend's house, she would just eat all the things. So I really want the kids to, you know, feel like they don't have any, um, limitations. I don't want them to have any weird relationships with food, but also teaching them, you know, I try to tell them things like we were in the car the other day and they were eating walnuts. And I was like, did you guys know that walnuts are good for your brain? They even look like a little brain. And they're like, wow. So I don't know if that'll ever stick with them. But, no, um, but I love that. Meditation and a mom and just, you know, cause you take your own relationships with food and then you process that. And it's like, it's just really important for me that they eat really healthy, but there's nothing weird about it. Like that they mm -hmm. also they go to a birthday party or were this or that, like they're going to eat stuff that I wouldn't normally buy or make at home, but I don't make a big deal about it. And they're allowed to have that too. Right. Absolutely. That's incredible. So important. Well, it was so wonderful having you on Megan. It was, I really do think that we could do like 300 other episodes together and talk about herbs and kids and this and that, like so many wonderful things, but that is, that's something we'll just have to schedule. Yes, we will. Cause I'm sure people are ready for us to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm sure they got a lot of good information, hopefully if they've made it this far and uh, you know, so definitely everybody check out Megan's resources. She's got an incredible YouTube channel. I even spent like 30 minutes watching her cooking shows for kids the healthy grocery girl. And they're so fun. I'm like, we have to send these to my nephew um, so she is full of amazing resources, but this, this thyroid balance course is really why we're here today. Um, but don't stop there with Megan's content. Cause she's got some amazing stuff that she puts a lot of work into. Oh, thank you, Erin. Yeah, of course. We'll have a wonderful rest of your week and happy holidays. And I'm sure we will chat soon.